Hey everybody, Chris here again. Welcome back to the channel. Always good to have you with us. So recently, I came across a video by Operation 8-Bit that explained concurrent DOS 386. I thought, wow, this is really cool. I need to give this a try for myself. So what I thought I would do today is load concurrent DOS 386 on bare metal as well as set up terminal access so that we can access it over a serial line. Anyway, what I'm going to show today is just how fun it was to get concurrent DOS 386 working on real hardware as well as setting up terminal access. Let's get right to it. So the first thing I thought I would try is to see if we can get concurrent DOS 386 working on a budget HP thin client. In the past, I did a video on this, and since it is a low-cost alternative, wouldn't that be great if it works? So what I've done is I've loaded up a thumb drive using a similar process that we used for the MS-DOS video, and I'm going to go ahead and put that into the thin client and see what happens. So there's that familiar UNet boot in menu we saw in a past video. Let's press enter. And immediately I'm noticing some very curious things. First of all, it thinks this machine only has 608 kilobytes of memory, which is not right. And also, we're stuck. As such, I don't think this idea is going to work. Well, so much for doing this on a budget. So next up, let's try this lovely IBM PS2 Model 30 286. Ooh, loading. That's a good sign. Requires Intel 8386 to run. Press Control Alt Delete. Well, I guess I really should have known better on this, right? Maybe the 386 and concurrent DOS 386 means you need to have a 386, and this is a Model 30 286. Well, in light of that, maybe we should try this on a real 386. And to assist, I've got my AST Premium Exec 386SX25 color. Well, that looks like success to me. We're finally starting to get somewhere, but let's keep going. Let's try something else. Let's try this out on my Pentium 200. Packard Bell Legend Supreme 1125 with 64 megabytes of memory. Ooh, that's a familiar sign. It looks like it starts to boot and then it gets stuck. And why in the heck does it think it has 42 megabytes of memory? That's an odd thing. All right, looks like it's showing the right amount of memory. That's a good sign. And it's still reading. Works. So there we have it. That's trick number one. 16 megabytes of memory or less, or perhaps fooling the machine to thinking it has less than 16 megabytes. More on that in a minute. Let's try another machine. Let's try this beast of a machine, an AMD Athlon-based system with 1.5 gigabytes of memory. It'll work, right? Certainly not. Ooh, that's a new one. The loading message completely disappeared. So this machine has a 40 gigabyte hard drive. I have an idea. Let's give it a try. Let's see, where's that hard drive power cable? So with the hard drive disconnected, it looks like we've made it further. But once again, there's that 386 paged memory of 600 and some K, in this case, 640 K. That looks like that's a bad sign. I bet we can get all of the way. I have another idea. Here in our BIOS settings, let's go into our advanced BIOS features and see if we have anything memory related. And we do have this boot OS2 for DRAM greater than 64 megabytes. Let's go ahead and turn that on and save our settings. This is looking like a good sign. And would you look at that? It looks like we booted all the way up. Now you won't see the concurrent DOS 386 screen this time because I booted from a system disk as opposed to an installed disk, 
but I'm gonna call this success. Pretty cool. So with this machine, we learned a couple of things. One, we don't seem to be processor limited. Two, we are hard disk limited, and we found that a 20 gigabyte drive will work, a 40 or 80 gigabyte drive will not. Not sure what the upper bound is, but that's what we found out so far. And three, if you have memory options you can adjust, such as memory usage for OS2 in your BIOS settings, give it a try. Making that adjustment may get things working. Let's try this generic Pentium 233 MMX with 64 megabytes of memory. And spoiler alert, you might have seen this machine in the intro, but huh, let's see if it's going to work. Looks like we're stuck again with 62 megabytes of detected memory. I think I might have an idea on how to make this work. Let's take a look. So heading into the BIOS, we're going to try a different feature this time. If I come down to the chipset features and I come down to the memory hole at address, let's just go ahead and poke a hole in memory at the 15 to 16 megabyte range and see if that gets us going. We'll go ahead and save and exit. And it looks like that did the trick. And there we go. Now this machine boots as well. So I think that setting that memory hole fooled concurrent DOS 386 to thinking, eh, this machine only has a certain amount of memory, in this case, 15 megabytes. As such, it proceeded to boot. So with that all set, I think we'll use this machine as our target. Uh, big surprise there, right? I mean, you did see it in the intro. <laughs> anyway, this is going to be the machine that we use to demonstrate what we're going to show next. And that's going to be how to access concurrent DOS over a serial connection. And I've got two ways that I want to show that. First, using a null modem cable, and second, using my RS-232 to Wi-Fi serial modem. So first, we'll use a NAW modem cable. And if my NAW modem cable looks a little funny, that's because it is. I actually have zip tied together here, a lap link cable and a NAW modem cable. I know, we're pretty fancy here. So ignoring the lap link cable, on one end we have a 25 pin serial, also connected to a nine pin serial. And the other end is the same. So we have our choice. We can go from 9-pin to 25-pin if we so desire. But before we hook up that NAW modem cable, we first need to configure concurrent DOS 386 to be looking for a serial connection. Let's do that. So just a quick note, I actually won't be covering the setup process for concurrent DOS. However, you can see Operation 8-Bits video on how to do that. What we will be covering, however, is how to configure those serial terminals. And to do that, we're going to type CDOS slash setup, and don't be tempted to change into that CDOS directory and run setup. It won't work. It tries to write out a configuration file on drive C at the root, and it will fail. So we'll press enter here. And what we're going to do is actually set up both of our COM ports to allow remoting in over a serial connection. So first we're going to go to setup workstations by pressing F3 and then F3 to set up the main console, which will be the first serial connection. And to do that, we need to configure COM1. So I'm going to hit F3 for that. From here, I'm going to hit F3 to change to a multi-user terminal. And we can review the other settings as well. Currently, we're set to 9600 baud. I want to bump that up. So I'm going to hit F4 to change that to 19200 baud. And finally, I want to set the protocol settings to be software flow control. So we'll hit F8. And we're going to hit F3 and F4 to turn off DTR, DSR, and hit F7, F8 to turn on X on, X off. From there, we can hit escape and go back to the previous menu. And we can hit escape again. So with that, our main console is configured. We now want to configure our multi-port card. And for that, we have a variety of options. I don't have any sort of fancy cards in this system. I just have COM2. But if we wanted to, if we had some fancy hardware, we could hit F4 to select that special multi-port card. That's how you get 
a lot of extra connections as opposed to one extra connection. However, I don't have any of those fancy cards from the 80s, so we can't do that. However, we can hit F6 to configure the multi-port card. And from there, we can see that we are now selected via COM2. If we hit F3, we can change to multi-user terminal. If we hit F4, we can bump up to 19200 baud. And then from there, F8. And we can also turn on software flow control with F7 and F8 and turn off DTR DSR with F3, F4. Excellent. Let's hit escape and we're configured. Hit escape again. And one more time. Okay, there's one other setting we have to change and that's related to the type of terminal emulation that we're going to use. So for that, I'm going to hit F4 and you'll see here that option F4 says PC emulation enabled. That means that this will emulate a PC term WISE 60 terminal. I tried and tried and tried. I could not find any software that worked right. So we're just going to use a plain terminal. So to change that, I'll hit F4. That will toggle that off. And that takes care of our first primary COM1 connection. If I hit F3, it'll pop over to COM2 and I can hit F4 and do the same thing. Perfect. With that, we can hit escape, followed by escape, and then we can hit F10 to update and exit. And you'll see that it's wanting to update the disk C or C drive. So from there, we can hit F5 to update the system and exit. And that CCPM sys file gets written out and a quick reboot will put us into terminal mode. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hook up the null modem cable to this machine as well as to my compact LTE 5400 sitting over there. I'm also going to switch the video source to my laptop so that we can see this terminal connection in action. And on the compact, we're going to load Bananacom. And I've actually already got it configured to COM1 with 1900, 200 baud. So let's press enter. Look at that, we have a C prompt. Let's do a DIR. There you have it. There's our concurrent DOS. We can go and run the setup program perhaps. Nope, you can only run that from the main console. They thought about that, didn't they? We could reboot the machine. And after a reboot, we can see that we get information about concurrent DOS starting up. That's pretty cool. So now for part two. Let's try this RS-232 serial to Wi-Fi modem. And what I needed to do with this modem was to put it into auto answer mode, as well as make a couple of software tweaks. So I actually filed a pull request and had the old net review it. Thank you very much. And I actually went ahead and loaded up the Arduino application and flashed a modified version of the software onto the device. And with that, the device is all set and ready to go. So loaded up here, I'm actually connected to the modem and the modem is set up to connect to my Wi-Fi access point. And I did make some changes to the modem software, as you saw, to basically disable all echoing for all commands. So right now I just typed the AT command, but you can see that nothing really happened. And that's by design, since any command that the modem displays would otherwise be sent back to the concurrent DOS session. So we would connect in, it would say connected 19200, and try to execute that as a command in concurrent DOS. So with that, you see nothing here on the console, but if I were to say ATV1, we would start to see commands come back. And if I were to say ATE1, we would see what we type being echoed going forward. From there, we can also set the baud rate to 19200, which I've also already done. So with that, we're all set and configured. And with our configuration set, we could do an ATNW to write it to the modem. I won't do that since we've already done that. And basically what that does is have the modem restored settings on power on. So with this, let's go ahead and connect the Wi-Fi modem over into the concurrent DOS server. So with the Wi-Fi modem connected and a quick reboot, just so that that kicks in and initializes the serial port, we're now ready to go ahead and run a program like netcat to access concurrent DOS. So what I'm going to do is SSH into my Raspberry Pi since I have a netcat program on my Raspberry Pi and that'll make things easier. So to access the concurrent DOS machine via the serial to Wi-Fi modem, 
we can type netcat and then the IP address of the modem which is 192.168.1.140 and the telnet port which is 23 and lo and behold it's loaded up now we do get a lot of C prompts so that tells me that something is pressing enter a lot I'm sure it has something to do with how things are configured here but for illustration purposes it gets the job done at this point we can go ahead and reboot that concurrent DOS machine and with the reboot complete we're greeted once again with the concurrent DOS startup screen concurrent DOS 386 3.0 so now I'm wondering can we access a concurrent DOS session over the internet after all it's just using the telnet protocol Maybe I should have somebody try it out and see what happens. Hey, Retro Tech Chris fans. This is Tony from Operation 8-Bit. I'm coming to you remote from New York. Chris has his machine up and running. And on my side, I've got a Linux VM running Debian out in Azure. So I'm just going to log into that with SSH. And from there, I'll fire off a netcat command with the connection properties that Chris sent me. And there you have it, a CDOS terminal session running over the internet from a VM in the cloud. Chris, thanks for letting me jump in here. I want to say what a fantastic job you did figuring out all the quirks with concurrent DOS to get it to run on modern hardware. All right, well, that's what I have for you today. A huge thank you to Operation 8-Bit. This was definitely their idea for a collab. I'm very glad to have participated in it, so a huge thank you there. So go and check out Operation 8-Bit's channel. I'll put a link up there in the corner. Go and subscribe and see what they're up to. And also, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, I strongly encourage you to do so. We've got a lot of content coming up here in the near future. If you like the video, please do give it a thumbs up. If not, please do consider sending me a strong message by pressing that thumbs down button twice. That's all for now. Can't wait to see you till next time. Bye now.